Hopefully, it, the, the lesson that I will be bringing will be edifying, will help you. Uh, when, when I was given the choice, <clears throat> there were several on the list that I was uh, champing at the bit to, to, uh, to, to, to do, and then Bill added this one. And, <laughs> well, I, 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 it really uh, grabbed me, it touched me, because, uh, well, you'll see in a moment why that is, but it, I think it's very, very important. Um, uh, it, it, it affects not just it, uh, new converts. A lot of times new converts have this question, what can I do? Because of the zeal that they have uh, in becoming a, a, a Christian, but even lifelong Christian, I dare say that uh, if, as I look out, uh, it, 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 it may very well be that maybe one person, uh, maybe probably not even one, uh, uh, it is not affected by this. We probably all have uh, family members, uh, e either immediate family, extended family, or, or somebody that we really care about that that uh, that, that, that are not Christians, and, and and we want to know what can I do? Well, what is it? How do I deal with them? Uh, because there's the I'm going to be touching on uh, sometimes sometimes they ignore you. It's very uh, passive rejection. Uh, they and sometimes. Uh, family members may be more aggressive in their rejection of Christ or uh, in not accepting Christ. And, and we're going to look at, at both of them, uh, but it, it, it's a timely subject. I, I thought about myself and my family and friends. And, and this is just going to be a real quick thing. It, this isn't up, uh, about me. It's not about my testimonials or anything like that. But, but I, I just want you to kind of understand how this affected me. Um, when I was baptized in, in October of, of 80, 1980, I was the first one. Um, most of my family members and people that I knew about, matter of fact, I don't know anybody who, who knew what Church of Christ was. Um, uh, and, and so uh, I was baptized, and, and I really wanted to, to teach uh, brother, uh, my, my brothers and sisters and my family they had seen, as, as my study had, had gone along, the changes, and uh, uh, they were interested. They weren't real interested, but they were, they, they were happy that <laughs> I was changing in that direction as opposed to where I was heading previously. But uh, then um, uh, shortly thereafter, uh, my, my wife-to-be um, uh, was baptized, and on the same night, uh, we were we got together and, uh, after she was baptized, and, and my brother uh, uh, he said, you know what, I've been thinking about this for a while, and I think I want to be baptized too. So we went back and, and uh, to the church building, and uh, he was baptized. And, and then uh, uh, my youngest brother, um, he started asking questions and questions and, and, and thinking about it. Uh, it took him a while, he, but he started. Uh, it took him years, but he eventually uh, accepted. He, and he would ask me questions, and, and you know, I was a new convert. I, I had all sorts of enthusiasm, but I didn't have all sorts of knowledge. Uh, and so, uh, but, but I wanted him to, to, to come to Christ. And so I would do whatever was uh, uh, you know, scripturally uh, correct to, 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 to help him. And then uh, um, my, I have two sisters. My, the first one was baptized. Um, after that, and then the other one, <clears throat> and you say, well, they, you know, that's great, you know, your family, but my dad, my mom died uh, uh, never accepting, never, at least not to my knowledge. Uh, she would say, you know, it's very good, it's done you a lot of good, but you know what, uh, uh, I'm not changing religions. And, and um, my dad uh, said the same thing up until he died. Um, my, uh, I have two older brothers, and, and they both died uh, not knowing or not naming Christ. Uh, and and um, I have one younger brother who was this close to death. He was in a coma. Uh, they were going to just pull the plug on him uh, just this past spring and, and summer. And... Uh, uh, we prayed for my. I'm sure I asked the brethren here to pray for my brothers, uh, and and um, uh, he 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 made it out. Uh, I had two brothers in the hospital at the same time. My oldest brother died, and my younger brother uh, uh, survived, and he has not uh, named Christ. Uh, 
And so, you, you know, you see what, I, what I'm getting at. Uh, I want my, my family to, to become Christians. And, and you would say I had a measure of success in that. Uh, not that I take credit for anything, but uh, in, in, in fulfilling that. Um, but the failures hit you right in the heart. And so it's something that I've had to deal with uh, um, throughout my Christian life. How do you deal with them? How do you deal with, with uh, uh, how, what can you do? And, I, and I've had a lot of time, a lot of uh, thinking about this. And, and so it's, uh, it, it, it's something that, that when I saw it, I, I'm like, you know, I, I really, really need to uh, uh, put this down and, and get this together. So what do you do? What do you do? What, what do you do so that, that you can get your whole family to become Christians? Let me uh, uh, tell you something. We want our loved ones to share in, in, in the spiritual joy that, that, that we embrace. And we see that in the scriptures. Andrew, in John chapter 1, verses 40 and 41, what did Andrew do when he, when he came to Christ? Uh, he immediately went and he got his brother. Uh, uh, Peter. And so Andrew, uh, w w when he recognized the Messiah, w w the first thing he did was he went and he got his brother. You know, he didn't go to his neighbors first. He didn't go to, to strangers first. And, and he could have, but he went straight to his brother and he said, you know what, come and see if we found the Messiah. It was that important to him. Um, uh, we see in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5, there was two ladies, Lois and, and her daughter Eunice. And uh, uh, they taught their, uh, who did they teach? Uh, said They taught their young uh, uh, child, uh, Eunice's uh, son, Lois's grandson, Timothy. They taught Timothy um, uh, the, the scriptures. And, and, and Paul says, you know, I, I, I'm well aware of the, uh, uh, the faith that is in you that was first in your mother and, and in your grandmother grandmother and mother. And so, you know, they taught him because it was that important. Yeah, Cornelius, when, when he was told that he needed to go and, and hear the word by which he would be saved, in Acts chapter 10 and verse 24, says that he took his family with him. He, he, when it's something that's important, you, you take your family with you, you do that. Uh, Lydia, when we read about Lydia, we don't read a whole lot about it, but that's what we do read. That she would baptize her and her, all of her household. It was that important to her that the, the, the good news that she heard, uh, she, she was uh, going to bring it to her household. And uh, that they, they had the same love for the, the, the scriptures that, uh, that, that they followed. And uh, uh, the Philippian jailer, we could go on and on, the Philippian jailer. Uh, when, he, uh, when he asked uh, uh, Paul and Silas, what, what should I do? And they told him what he needed to do. It says that he, that he was washed, he was baptized uh, at that very hour, and, and, and he and his household. And so, you see, we want uh, to include our household, our families, uh, when, whenever we, we, we make that, because it's an important decision for us. Um, the fact is that it doesn't always happen. The fact is that, like I said, probably all of us here, and I don't know the details of all of our family, but probably all of us here have some family member that, that is not a Christian. Uh, and it, it, we, we think about it, and we, what can I do? What, 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 is, what, what is it that I can do? Jesus knew the feeling. Um, even before his incarnation, we see that uh, uh, in, in the patriarchal age, uh, mankind, uh, uh, we are his children. And uh, they were disobeying Adam and Eve disobeyed uh, they separated they were separated from God uh, in, in the times of Noah uh, uh, God was uh, 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 sorry that, that he had made man and uh, he had to uh, in the time of Noah he had to uh, uh, punish mankind because of, of what he had done but you see he didn't want to, to do that he, what he wanted, uh, at all times, and, and we read that in the Old Testament, God doesn't take any pleasure in the death of the, un of the unrighteous. What he wants is, he wants for us to come to a full knowledge of God. He wants us to be saved. Uh, the Jews and the Israelites, you ever read uh, the book of Ezekiel or the book of uh, Jeremiah? Uh, any of those, uh, you see how much God pleads with the people. He says, please come back. I can fix this. He says, I can take care of this. It doesn't have to be this way. Uh, and, and so, 
uh, Jesus knows the feeling um, uh, of what what it is, what it means to to have somebody who who you love that doesn't want to walk uh, in the paths of righteousness. Uh, it, and uh, during his ministry here on earth, uh, the Bible talks about the fact that his brothers uh, did not believe in him. We'll touch on that in a moment. Uh, his disciples didn't believe on him uh, through many times. Uh, uh, you know, he walked with uh, Judas for three and a half years, and uh, uh, Judas betrayed him. You think that didn't hurt uh, Jesus? Jesus gave him time, chance time and time again. To, that he wasn't obligated to, to betray Jesus, uh, but uh, Jesus uh, uh, had that. And so Jesus knows what it's like. Uh, uh, his other followers, people who were uh, zealously trying to do this or to do that, uh, oppose him or, 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 or promote him uh, more than, than he, he should have. And the fact is, uh, they were seeking their own righteousness and they weren't uh, seeking God's righteousness. And so, you know, he knows what it's like. Uh, he knew before he, his incarnation, after his incarnation, well, wait a second, uh, he also knows uh, now, after his resurrection. If you look at any of the letters, of, uh, well, at least most of the letters, not all of them, most of the letters in the book of Revelation, uh, Jesus is writing to the, these churches and he tells them, he says, you know, you, you need to repent, you need to change, you need to come back to me. Uh, he's not happy with the way they are. And, and, uh, and, and, uh, these are Christians. And so, uh, you know, before his ministry, before his incarnation, during his ministry, and even after his resurrection, God knows what it's like for uh, people to reject him, to, uh, and, and he wants us to, to, to be faithful to him. So Jesus lays down some principles. And uh, he follows them. He followed them during his ministry on earth. And we see them in the Old Testament. And we see them in, in, in the early church and, uh, and the instruction. And those are the ones we should follow too. And so I, I want to touch on three basic principles. Then I, I want to uh, touch on, on, on some verses. Uh, first of all, there's no magic word. Uh, if, if you came thinking that, you know, okay, I need to do this. And, and if I do this, my, uh, my, my brother who isn't really interested, will all of a sudden, if I could say, you know, uh, you know, Romans 16, 16 to you, and you would, oh, no, that's right, you know, I need to become a Christian. Or if I could say, you know, uh, uh, Matthew 18, uh, you know, or anything like that, and, and I, 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 I'd be the first one to tell you that. It, there is none. There is no, a, God's power to salvation is the word of God, but there is no magic word that we can, uh, as much as we might want someone to accept Jesus as Savior, the choice is theirs. Just like we had to make a choice, they have to make a choice. All we can do is try to help them along, and, and, and that's basically once we follow these principles. I think that you'll see that uh, what it is that, that we can do. It's not we're not going to sit on our hands, but there are certain things. Jesus. Uh, in the parable of the sower, one of the types of soils was the hard ground, the one that was beside the road. In Matthew chapter 13 and verse 4, the very first one. And in verse 19, he explains what that soil is. And uh, the seed didn't penetrate that soil. When the seed was spread, it just lay there on the ground. It didn't penetrate. And, and Jesus says uh, in, in verse 19, when he explained, he says that that's the type, that's a person who doesn't understand it. The guy's heart is, is hard, and he doesn't understand. He, he doesn't allow uh, the, 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 the Word of God, in, in, for whatever reason, lack of love, uh, lack of wisdom, lack of whatever, he doesn't understand there is that type of person, that type of soil. Uh, and only he can change his heart. Uh, but uh, he says uh, what happens then is that the birds came, and they ate uh, the, 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 the seeds up, ate them up. And he says, uh, in the explanation, that means that Satan has come and takes the word away from their heart. There is going to be people like that. Uh, and so we, we can't, the choice has to be theirs. It cannot be, we cannot force feed them. Nobody will be pushed into heaven. Nobody will accidentally stumble and fall into heaven. It's a choice they must make. Um, uh, if anyone could force or convince them someone, it would be God. 
and he doesn't do it. If anyone could force uh, your uh, family member or your loved one to become a Christian, it would be God, and he doesn't do it that way. He, what he does is he makes it available to them. And so that's the first principle, that uh, the choice is going to be theirs. There is no magic word, no magic potion, no magic anything uh, to try to, to get them to become Christian. The choice must be theirs. Second of all, we have to understand a, 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 a concept, a principle, uh, that a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown. Jesus said that. And Jesus said that. Let's go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 13 uh, in verses uh, uh, 53 to, to the end of the chapter there, through 58. <clears throat> Matthew 13. Let's look at this, this passage and, and, and the context. Uh, what exactly is going on here? <clears throat> Matthew 13, starting in verse 53. Uh, and when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there, and coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue. And so, uh, so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his uh, sisters with us? Where then did he, this man get all of these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. Notice verse 58. And he did not uh, do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Let's look at that just a little bit together. <clears throat> Jesus uh, has, has given the parables, the one we just looked at, the uh, parable of the sower, and, and then he goes to his hometown. They are astonished. Whereas other people are receiving him, where other people are accepting him, uh, remember in, in Matthew chapter 7, it says that, that the people were astonished that they were uh, at, at the mighty works. There were many people following him. These people are astonished too, but they take offense at him. They say, who is this guy? You know, we know him. We know this guy. We know his mom. We know his dad. We know what he did. We knew him when he was a kid. Uh, we know his brothers and his sisters. Uh, uh, who is this guy? And it was in a sense that, 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 uh, that because they knew him, uh, he couldn't be that important. And brethren, uh, that happens to us also. Guess what? We go home and, or in the congregation where we're at or wherever in our neighborhood, people know us. People at, 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 at home, they know what our breath smells like in the morning. They see our dirty clothes. They see us rushing around here and there. They see when we stumble. Uh, they, they, they know that. And oftentimes, they will not respect us like we, they should. Even if we're bringing them the scripture. Not because we are all that, but because we're teaching them about God. A lot of times, people simply do not respect somebody that they know. And we have to understand that. When we're trying to teach our family members, the fact is that sometimes we may be too close to them. And so it might be better if someone else from the congregation uh, might have a better effect on them. The preacher, uh, you know the preacher, you, you, you kid around with him and everything. It might be better, uh, though, that, that because they don't know him as well, or if, if it's your daughter or somebody young, maybe an, an, an older lady from the congregation, somebody else uh, comes, and, and even if they're saying the same thing that you said, it might have an effect on them. I don't know how many times I've, I've given a sermon and, and then we have a gospel meeting and some preacher comes and, and I'm like, he took that sermon off my website. Yeah. It, it, that's my sermon right there. And, and uh, uh, all of a sudden, you know, people are like, wow, this guy has brought, like, given us a lot of information. I'm like, okay, you know, I'm glad that they heard it. 
Uh, it's not something to take offense about. Uh, I'm glad that they hear it. Same thing with the family. Sometimes you tell them something and over and over again with your children or something, and, and, and they don't hear you. And somebody else comes and says the exact same thing, and, and it's like, wow, it, 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 this is amazing. And that's great. Don't get bugged about it. I don't get bugged about it. I'm, I'm, I'm just happy that that person said it and, and it made it through. Uh, sometimes, you know, you are just too close and you have to understand that. Uh, or maybe they say this, the same thing that you're saying, but maybe it's in a different way. Uh, you, you've always said it this way. Somebody else changes it, gives a different example, and all of a sudden, you know, uh, the lights come on. That's great. Sometimes we as Christians feel that we must be the one that converts our family. We must be the one that says those things that, that somehow cause No, it may be somebody else. That principle is there, and, and we need to recognize it and deal with it. It's not a matter of pride. If it becomes a matter of pride, then you, you've got the wrong reason for it anyway. And so uh, we need to remember that, that uh, sometimes we may be just be too close. Uh, uh, verse 58 says, he did not do many miracles. There, what's that mean? He didn't lose his power to do miracles. What, what that meant was there wasn't a, a whole lot of reason to do miracles there. Why? Because they already didn't respect him for that. In, in John chapter 7 and verse 5, uh, his brothers tell him, hey, well, aren't you going to go up to the feast? You really need to go up to the feast and, and, and do things in public if you were going to uh, be leading all these people. But uh, John says, they weren't sincere. He says, they, were, they told him that because they did not believe on him. His own brothers, his family, the family of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, God incarnate, didn't believe on him. If anybody needed to believe on him, it was his family. They didn't believe on him. And so when, when that happens in your family, you're in good company. God knows exactly what you're going through. Jesus knows exactly what you're going through. He knows that, that he, wants, he wanted them to, to, to come to salvation, and they weren't believing on him. You want your family to come to salvation, and, and they're not believing on you. The third principle that I, I want us to, to remember is that uh, we have to let the light shine out. Now, I just said that uh, uh, sometimes they don't pay attention to you or, or, or they ignore you. Uh, and, and that's true, but that doesn't, never excuses us from letting God's light shine. Matthew chapter 5, 5 verses 13 and 16, Jesus talks about you are the salt of the earth, you are uh, the light. And he says that, uh, and, and now that's a declaration, you are the light of the world, let your light shine, he says. And he says you, you don't cover uh, the light up, you, you do what light does, you, you let it shine uh, to other people. Our light uh, it's our light, but it does not originate in us. That's important that we understand. In 1 John chapter 1 and uh, verse 5, it says that God is light. In uh, John uh, chapter, uh, regular, uh, the epistle of John, chapter 1 and verse 9, 9 says that uh, about Jesus Christ, in him was light and the light was the life of the world. He is the light. Uh, Jesus is the light. Uh, in, in John chapter 8 and verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light. And it can't get any plainer than that. And so when we talk about our light, that doesn't mean it originates with us. It's not that we are letting out light. Rather, it is God's light in us that we have made it our own because of, of, of following God. We have let God's light shine through us. And uh, if you think of it uh, like this, I've got a couple of examples here. One is moonlight. You, you see the moon, you see the moon is really bright on something. The moon does not produce light. The moon does not, you, you say the stars produce light and planets uh, reflect the light and stuff, but the moon, the moon is so bright on some, on some uh, uh, nights, and it's not producing its light. That moonlight is really just reflected sunlight. Right? That's how we have to consider ourselves. We are going to let God's light shine through us. It will become our light because people are seeing it in us, but it originates with God. You, you see a, a reflection in a mirror, or uh, you got a lamp that, that's, that's letting out light. What, what's the best thing you can do to let out, maximize that, that light 
getting getting out, and that's to clean the the, the mirror, clean the, the window panes, uh, clean that glass. The the less people can see of us, the the more they can see of Christ. The less they see of our sins, of our stumbling. Uh, the more they can see the light of Christ that is in us. And so we can do that. That's something we can do, but it's a very basic principle. We're going to let our light shine, but it doesn't originate with us. It originates in God, and we are reflecting. And so we need to do whatever is possible to reflect that. There's a song that we sing. I, I hope you guys sing it, too. Uh, uh, we sing it uh, that, that we are uh, the world's Bible. And, and, and uh, it, it basically talks about when people, when we go out there, people are going to see uh, uh, our lives and they're going to say, you know, uh, uh, they're either going to be attracted or they're going to be uh, uh, distracted uh, or repelled by the way we behave. Uh, when we go out there and people know that we're Christians, they're going to say, what a hypocrite. I don't, need, I don't need to go to church. I can be a hypocrite at home. I can be a hypocrite wherever I am without going to that church. Or they could say, this person, I knew this person. And, and, and this person has changed completely. I want to know what, what caused that. Or even if they never knew us, they could say, this person has some, uh, some, some, some God-fearing principles. He's honest. He or she is honest. Uh, in, in their dealings. They, they are they're prayerful, they're helpful. Uh, you know, the words that come out of their mouth are, are, are edifying. And they'll say, you know, I, I'm interested in how that person became that way. Uh, in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 5, the, the latter part of it, Jesus talking about hypocritical judging. But uh, one of the things he says, a lot of times we, we, over, we miss this because we're, we're talking about the, the fact that he's talking to the hypocrites and stuff. It's, he lays down a principle that, that applies to everybody. And that is, he says, first take the beam out of your own eye. Why? So that you can help the other person uh, with the speck in their eye. We don't tell the other person, hey, look, deal with your speck because I've got this beam in my eye. And, uh, and so I'm not going to help you. He says, take that out. You take care of yourself so that you can uh, uh, help that other person. Second Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, Paul says, examine yourselves. Test yourselves. It's a responsibility that we have. If we're going to let God's light shine in our lives, we have to be the ones that are examining ourselves and testing ourselves. We don't test ourselves by ourselves. We test ourselves against the, the standard, which is the Word of God. And that benefits us, first and foremost. And then second of all, it benefits those people that we're trying to help, uh, trying to set an example for. And then third of all, it helps anybody else that's, that's happening to be uh, observing you. Some, a lot of times you, you have a benefit to somebody that, that you didn't uh, plan uh, is, 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 uh, shows an interest in God. The next thing that, that I want to talk about is praying. And, and you say, well, you know, this is a... a a duh category, uh, but it's not. How many times uh, uh, do you not uh, pray about things? You don't want to bother God, uh, or you know, you've already prayed about that, uh, or you know, it's not that important, whatever. Uh, I, I dare say that any failure that you have in your life, anyone in your life, I'm not talking about other people's lives, remember, they, they're going to have to accept God on their own. But any failure you have in your life has is, is got to be a prayer failure also. It's tied to prayer failure. Uh, because God wants what is best for you. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, he has so many things prepared for you, uh, far more be beyond what you're able to think or, or, or ask for. But we don't ask for them. We, we don't, we don't uh, uh, come to God. And so we, we don't want to hide our prayers. Um, and, or we don't want to flaunt them either, either extreme. Uh, before our family members. What you need to do is, um, uh, if, if it's time to pray, if you've decided I'm going to pray when I get up, uh, when I go to bed, uh, before, the, uh, before I eat, uh, uh, whatever, whatever your decision is, you do that. If your family members are there, great, let them see you, but you're not doing it for them, you're talking to God. And if they're not there, you're still going to talk to God. 
Okay? You don't want to hide from your family member. You don't want to flaunt it before them. Hey, look at this. I'm praying to God, and, and, and you're not because I'm, I'm a better person than you are. But your conversation is with God, and it needs to be as natural as possible, as, as you would talk to God. Um, uh, if you hide, you, you're showing fear or embarrassment uh, of your Christianity, and you don't want to do that. But if you're flaunting it, that, that, that shows pride and, and confrontation. It's in your face type, type thing. And again, you don't want to do that either. What you want to do is you want to pray. Uh, pray uh, at, at all times, and especially pray for your family, for your loved ones. Pray for them. Uh, name them specifically. Uh, I name my family members specifically when I pray for them. Uh, God knows who I'm praying for. If I was to uh, offer a generic uh, prayer, God would still know. All right? And, and so it's not for God's benefit. It's for our benefit. And, uh, you know, it it's reminds us who it is that, that, that uh, we, we need to try to do what we can for. Uh, James chapter 5, verses 16 to 18, James says, you know, the, 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 the effective prayer of a righteous man avails much. And he, he talks about <clears throat> Elijah. Well, if you go back to 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 42 to 45, it, 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 to find out that example that he talks about, he says, you know, he prayed and there was no rain, and then he prayed again, and uh, uh, there was no rain for three and a half years, and he prayed again, and then there was uh, and then it rained, right? And he sums it up. We go back to 1 uh Kings chapter 18, verse 42 to 45, after uh, his confrontation with, with the, the priests of Baal and stuff, uh, he, what he does is he, he, he kneels down, uh, uh, prostrates himself, um, uh, puts down, you know, and, and tells his servant, go and check. He, and, and he prays seven times before uh, his servant comes and says, hey, there's, I see a, a, a cloud coming. It's about as big as a man's fist. And he says, that's it. That was the answer. And, by the time, and he says, go tell Ahab. He says, you better get going because there's going to be a downpour coming like you wouldn't believe. You don't want to be stuck out here. And so, you know, he had complete faith. But he had to pray seven times. It didn't come the first time or the second time or the third, fourth, fifth, or sixth time. Sometimes we have to pray more than once. And we have to be specific what it is that, that we want. That is extremely important. When we want to... Uh, 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 help our family members. Pray for them. Specifically pray for them. Don't just say, and I wish that my family members were, uh, you know, were, were all Christian. Pray for them specifically uh, uh, about that. <clears throat> and pray for yourself. Pray that you might do the things that are uh, pleasing to God, first and foremost, and second of all, those things which are going to edify your family, those things which are going to help your family. These are things you can do. Remember, uh, they, ultimately, they will make their own choices. They will stand before God based on the choices that they made. God himself doesn't force anybody to do anything. There are only things that we can do. We can do on behalf of them, or we can do for them, we can do uh, with them, but it's ultimately going to be uh, uh, their responsibility. In 1 Peter chapter 3, and verse 15, and the, the immediate context, of course, is found in, in verses 13 and 14. Uh, Peter is, of course, uh, writing to, to people who uh, were, were being persecuted, actually, uh, throughout uh, the, 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 the world. And uh, uh, he sends out the letter, and he wants to encourage them uh, to, 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 uh, to do those things which are right. In 1 Peter chapter 3, and we read verse 15. I'd like to read 13 and 14 first in order to get the, the context. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, uh, not, uh, not, nor be troubled. But in your heart regard Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. I want to look at that, that, that passage um, uh, little by little. First of all, the context, uh, these were people who were uh, going to be uh, persecuted because of their Christianity. 
Uh, and yet, th this applies to them much more for us who, who are persecuted. Sometimes, if you're a, a, a Christian woman and your husband is not a, a, a Christian, uh, he may persecute you. He may give you a hard time. Uh, it sometimes works the other way. Uh, a wife giving a hard time to, to a man who has decided to become a Christian. But usually, it's, uh, it, it's, it's the first way. Uh, a woman becomes a Christian, a husband gives her a hard time. But uh, Peter says, first of all, sanctify Christ in your hearts. It, it, it's so important. We, we talk about always having ready, being ready, but there's a, 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 a prologue to that. There's a previous thing to that. There's something that has to be done first, and that's to sanctify Christ in your heart. You notice in James chapter 4 and verse 7, we, all, we often talk about that, resist the devil and he will flee. Before that, he says something just like this. He says that first we're supposed to do what? Obey God. We're supposed to sub submit to the Lord. If you submit to God, then you resist the devil and he will flee. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, that starts that passage about uh, 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 putting on the full armor of God and resisting Satan. What is the first thing you're supposed to do? Submit to God. You're supposed to put on the full armor of God. In each and every case, and we'll see that over and over and over again, uh, there is something we need to do first. And before we do this, we need to do uh, that first. Submit to God. Put, uh, sanctify. Make holy Christ in our hearts first. That's the first thing to do. Make sure that we are uh, following faithfully Christ. That our relationship with God has to come first. And then, he says, always being ready. You grow, then you show. You always, be, in order for you to be ready, you need to study. In order for you to be able to, to give somebody a, a reason for your hope, you better know what that reason is. You study that, you know what that is, you are ready for that. And that takes a lot of studying for a small window of opportunity. And we need to do that. Uh, we need to be ready when that opportunity comes. The only way to do that, there is no shortcut. The only way to do that is by studying and, and knowing. Why do I believe this? Because the church says so? Because the preacher says so? Because everybody that I know says so? No. It, because it's the right thing. Because that's what God teaches. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2 is basically what, what, what uh, uh, Paul is telling Timothy. Be ready, he says, in season and out of season. Now, that these are words to a preacher. But the, the important thing is we always need to be ready. Whether you're a preacher, whether you're not a preacher, always be ready for the things that are going to be coming. You cannot be ready if you don't prepare stuff. If you don't sanctify Christ in your heart first. But then he says to give a defense to everyone. A lot of times we talk about this, we talk about, you know, strangers. As somebody on the street comes and asks you, hey, why do you have a, why are you a Christian? And you, because they see you praying at the restaurant, or, hey, how come, are you a Christian? And you're ready. And, but the, to everyone. And if anything, the, the, the person, the people who are going to ask you the most, the people who are going to notice the most are the people who are closest to you. They're family members. And so you are going to be ready to show them when, when, when they ask you for a reason for the hope. Uh, you've got to ask your co-workers. Uh, I mean, it applies to co-workers, to neighbors, to schoolmates, but especially to family and friends who see the changes. Uh, they also see the flaws. All right? uh, don't defend these. When, when your family member says, you know what, uh, you fudged on the truth there, uh, don't try to defend it. If you did it, say, you know what, you're right. I need to repent of that. And I'm going to ask your, your forgiveness because I, I, I did that in front of you. And I'm going to ask God's forgiveness too. And I'm going to go try to make that right. Don't defend it. Do not defend it. Uh, well, you know, you're, you just don't understand. I've got a, a deeper understanding. And, and it's okay under these circumstances to do this. Don't. Don't do that. You play right into the devil's hands. Uh, God knows that you sin. You know that you sin. And those who are closest to you know that you sin. Or at least that you were very unwise in what you did. 
be able to admit that because you don't want the focus on you, you want the focus on Christ. Uh, and so you always uh, are ready to give a defense to everyone, not for your action, but for the hope that is in you. With gentleness and reverence, it's not a big fight. It's not an argument. Too many times things get into argument. You, you go home and you talk to your spouse and, 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 you, and, you, and you're full of, 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 of uh, edification of what, what you heard at the, uh, at the assembly. And, and, and Satan says, I don't want you to be full of that. I got something else for you. And, and you go home and you start talking to your family member and, and it soon starts degrading. You want them to have that enthusiasm, they don't. You want to talk to, about it, they don't. Set your mind not to have a fight when you go to, to, to talk to somebody, even if they ask a question. They say, well, what about this? And you start talking to them, and, and you see that, it's, that they ask with the, with, the, with the intention of arguing or whatever, be able to cut it off. Say, okay, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I think that we've probably gone as far as we possibly can on this one. Uh, don't win the argument and lose the war, to, to paraphrase the saying. Uh, uh, you don't want to win that argument at all costs and then have the person become bitter. And, and, and more rebellious. You want to be able to say, okay, I'm backing off. I'm not going to force uh, uh, you to, to admit something that you're not ready to. All right? um, there's a, a, a danger uh, of any conversation degrading, no matter how well-intentioned you, you are. Uh, any conversation can degrade. Believe me, <laughs> it's happened to me. Uh, and at first, you, you got all the zeal, and, and you want to prove this point, because if they just understand this, they'll become a Christian. And then they're, go. they're not ready for it. They haven't prepared their heart for it. And all you're doing is you're forcing something on them that, that they, they're not interested in. Um, and then uh, I want to speak specifically about the family. You know, all these are, are general principles and, 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 and things that we want to, to remember. But you say, how about something specific? I, I can't get into specifics of each of uh, our, because I don't know. But I can tell you what the Bible says. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, um, and, and, you know, I can, we could probably do a whole series of studies just on this uh, uh, topic here, but First Peter chapter three verses one and two. Um, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives, when they uh, when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Notice what he says there. The goal is salvation. If that requires that you not speak the word with your mouth, you can still speak it with your actions. Submit, therefore, that they may be won by the word. That's where the focus is. That's where our goal is. God's word. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to all those who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You want somebody saved? They're going to have to believe God's word. And if God says, hey, that somebody doesn't want to hear it, that's okay. Because I've got another way that you can uh, give them my word through your conduct. That's how you can do it. Actions speak louder than words. And so sometimes uh, a wife has to be, um, uh, 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 be careful that she doesn't Let her enthusiasm uh, cause her to do something that, that would not be edifying. Um, and so sometimes the wife has to, Peter says, sometimes you have to win them without a word. And you do that by your conduct. Uh, and so wives, and, and I believe that, that this, it's a principle 
that is laid down now, he's applying it to, to wives, uh, be in subjection to their husband. But the purpose, the principle of it, is something that can apply to all of us. Sometimes, uh, wherever we are, um, if uh, uh, we are not, um, uh, uh, it's not expedient to be uh, out there uh, preaching the word with our mouth, we can preach it with our actions. And uh, it, it's something that applies in any situation, whether one-on-one -on -one or whether in a group or, or wherever we are. Um, and so, uh, but especially with family and friends, uh, sometimes you win them to the word without a word. And then, uh, but there are other situations too. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, um, uh, and, and it extends even past that, but I, I want to focus on verse, the first four verses, which talk about the family. Children uh, are to uh, obey and respect uh, their, their parents. We usually apply this to little kids at home, but this, it's not uh, uh, limited to that. Sometimes we uh, want our parents to to come to Christ, and we don't talk to them in a very respectful way. We do not talk to them in a way that uh, that that God that pleases God. And so, if we are discussing um, uh, Christianity with our parents, um, we are we have a responsibility to be obedient and and to honor them. Uh, and I believe that that's what. Uh, the principle that Paul is laying down. And the context, the immediate context, I believe, is in the family situation, uh, uh, children, uh, you know, if you become a Christian when you're 12 or 13 years old or 14, uh, you, you, that would apply to you. Um, but I believe that even after you're a grown adult, you still need to honor your parents and you still need to respect them um, in a way that um, would be pleasing to God. And, and, and that can... Uh, work wonders in, in uh, them becoming uh, Christians. Uh, and then he goes on to the parents, verse 4. Um, you you want to train your children? <coughs> Don't exasperate them. Don't bring them to anger. Sometimes we humiliate our children, uh, trying to get them to, to uh, uh, accept Christ. Uh, you know, it, it was a very difficult thing for me as, I was grow as my children were growing up. Uh, I, I made it a, uh, I had a wise uh, uh, teacher who told me that I had to make uh, the, the faith their own. The faith had to belong to them. They were, they were going to eventually leave the house, and they had to have their own faith. They couldn't rest on my faith. Um, and so what I would do is I would uh, encourage them to know the scripture readings. I, when we had the workbooks, uh, I would uh, get them to answer all. I always tried to keep them two weeks ahead so that there, there wasn't pressure and they could mull things over. Uh, but not only that, I would go the extra mile with them. Say, okay, what's the context with it? What is, uh, you know, what's he saying? What's another verse or another passage that somebody might ask? Uh, and, and, and at first it was kind of frustrating for them. And, and, and you had to back off because... Uh, it was, but what happened was that they saw that, hey, you know what? The teacher asked this question that wasn't in the workbook, and I knew the answer because we had discussed it. And pretty soon they see the benefit of it, and, and, and the faith starts becoming their own. They do it because they want to do it. That's what God's telling us. God says you show them. God says you discipline them and instruction. Not with anger, but with discipline and instruction. It's our responsibility. Too many times we want somebody else to, to take care of uh, uh, our children's spiritual uh, uh, growth. God, I mean, it's nice, it's good that the brethren have classes and stuff. That's, that's great. But it's my responsibility that I teach my children that to, to serve the Lord. And I'm going to do that uh, with... Uh, instruction and discipline. Sometimes uh, you, you've got instructive discipline where you, you're teaching them, and sometimes you've got to use corrective discipline where they are doing something, you know, sometimes a, uh, a child will say, 
I don't want to go to church. You know, and, and you let them know right away that is never an option. That is never. Do not ever, do not even think that. Uh, you might as well get that out of your mind right now because you'll be there. Um, and it, it, it will escalate if you do not learn right now. And, and so what, and you need to do that while they're young. It's Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. And, and when he is older, he, he will uh, continue in it. Uh, you want him to want them to know when they're young. Um, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6 through 9. Uh, what's called there in chapter 6, verse 6, the Shema. God, and know this, O Israel, that the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And he says, you will you show your children. He says, when you uh, get up in the morning, when you go to bed at night, when you're at home or when you're out by the gate, you know, out on the path. Uh, he said, you will write it on, on the lentils of the door and in the gate. It, it, at all times, when you sit down to eat, when you get up, uh, you're going to let them know God is central. It's a very part of God is not some compartment in, in your life. And so uh, when it comes to... Uh, uh, Children, we have more latitude because they are children, um, and and we can uh, we can teach them. Once they become adults, we don't have that latitude. We don't have uh, that ability. Um, and if they uh, these they have now become our spouse, uh, the the one who needs to uh, become a Christian, we have even less. Uh, it's not impossible, uh, but it is necessary. And so basically, I, 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 I focus on their, the choice will be theirs. What can I do to facilitate that? What can I do that, that will please God and facilitate that uh, for them? Uh, inclusion. Remember, it's ultimately each person's responsibility how they'll behave before God. Your responsibility is to let Jesus' light shine. Theirs is to answer the call. Pray for them. Prayer is often overlooked or minimized. Pray for them uh, that, that they might. Even Jesus didn't convert everyone that he met. And so God knows, and, and, and you're not going to convert everybody that you meet. It's not going to happen. Um, but uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 11 and 12, he says, Be blameless. That's what you need to do. Be blameless. Be clean that 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 that, that mirror. Clean that, that that window so that God's light can shine. Be blameless, uh, and and so that even if uh, in the judgment day, uh, even uh, they'll uh, whatever happens on the judgment day, you'll be vindicated and you'll be you have done right. Remember these things. God has done His part. You need to do your part, and they must do their part. Uh, put God first in all things and let his light shine in you. But make it your own. Make that light your own. Don't just, don't just reflect it off. Make it your own. Let it be your light too. Be blameless and pray always. And that's what I, all I got. I don't know if I answered the question. Um, hopefully I, I did. Um, any questions? Okay. I'll start it off because I don't want you to get off the hook too easy. Uh, you made a comment.